What's up guys, it's Daniel here from Me at the Pianos, and today I'm going to be counting down my top 20 albums of 2020. 2020, I would say, is the year I've listened to the most music in my life. Not just because of pandemic stuff, but also because I've just been getting more and more into music, starting this channel, trying to actively listen to as much music as I possibly can. So... Yeah, I'm really proud with how this list turned out this year. There's a lot of albums on this list that I wouldn't necessarily call mainstream or anything. Some really underground stuff that friends have shown me on Bandcamp or SoundCloud. But I'm really excited to share those albums with you the most, actually. Because I think those are the albums that really deserve more attention and deserve to have more people talking about them, and I hope that this video could be the start of a conversation about those smaller albums. But yeah, besides that, um, I have a lot to get through, so I think I'm just gonna get started on this list. At number 20 on my list is Stick Lip by Beck Plexus. Stick Lip is a really interesting, experimental, kind of popish album from Beck Plexus, who was an artist I hadn't heard of until this year. And while this song did have my Song of the Year mirror image, which is an incredible song that all of you should check out, I actually did a write-up of it on my Instagram account. But I don't quite think that the rest of the album lives up to this song totally. This is kind of the high watermark. It's an incredible song. But Regardless, I do think that there are a lot of interesting experiments on the rest of this album. She uses her voice, she uses her instruments in really interesting and unique ways, using some glitch music and some uh, really interesting rhythmic stuff along with some of those pop sensibilities. It's a really interesting album, even if upon further listens, um, especially recently, I haven't been the absolute biggest fan of it outside of Mirror Image. And at number 19 on my list, we got Slauson Malone with Crater Speak. This is kind of more of an EP, but since I didn't really listen to many EPs this year, I just thought I would include it on this list. Um, it's kind of a c continuation of Slauson Malone's previous album, A Quiet Farewell, 2016 to 2018, which if you know me in person, you'll know that's one of my favorite albums ever. And I think that this is a really good album, continuing these kind of themes. I don't find that it blows me away quite in the same way that A Quiet Farewell does. He's, you know, doing some more singer-songwriter elements on this album. Um, kind of playing with some of those same ideas, twisting them, and creating new things out of them. And I think, I do think it's really interesting, um, especially the title, the full title of this, which um, is German for like looking back on the past, which obviously is a theme that Slauson Malone plays with quite a lot throughout his music, and it's really interesting. So, yeah, I mean, if you're a fan of A Quiet Far Well, I would definitely check this EP out, and, you know, it's good enough to make my year-end list, so, yeah, really, really solid EP from Slauson Malone, and I guess if you want to count it that way, it's uh, my EP of the year. At number 18, we got Liturgy, Origin of the Alimonies. Really, really great metal opera. It kind of shows some of those philosophical themes that she was exploring on Hack, as well as her previous work too. Kind of showing some of those um, origins, as is stated in the title, of those philosophical themes and I'm gonna be totally honest I don't totally understand all of it I'm sure if I really delved a little bit deeper into it I could get a fuller understanding of all of that but I do still think that there's a lot of interesting things going on her release last year hack I still think stands as her masterpiece an incredible transcendental black metal album but this one is still really interesting, especially if you want more context to some of her philosophical themes presented in a really interesting narrative throughout this. Um, I really loved this. I really did. Um, I might have thought that one epic song, the 15-minute song on here, is a little bit too long, but overall, really, really great 
album from Liturgy. And at number 17, we got Youth Service with Out of Focus. I've reviewed this one on my channel, so if you want more in-depth thoughts on this, you can check it out. But really, such a solid rap album. One of my favorite rap albums of this year. It shows uh, the members of Youth Service really coming together in such a great way, even though they weren't in person together for a lot of it kind of taking their role as the new Brockhampton or Injury Reserve with that kind of rap group aesthetic. And it works super, super well. I do think, obviously, there are some things that they will be able to um, improve for their next releases, but, man, I absolutely love this thing. If you're a fan of Brockhampton or Injury Reserve, I highly recommend checking this out. And at number 16, we got Method's Bodies with their self-titled. This is a really strange album. I'm not sure exactly how I would categorize it. It's got some polyrhythmic stuff, some really cool melodies in there, some, you know, kind of longer pieces split up into different parts by songs. And there's also some really cool stuff like chanting and really weird entrancing things on this album that really fascinated me. I don't really know a ton about this album, but I've come back to it a lot over the course of this year. Um, it's really enthralled me with how unique and boundary pushing it is, especially with its rhythmics, which feel so fascinating and just pull me in every single time I listen to it. I really, really love this thing, and I'm really excited to see where Method's Bodies go next. And at number 15, we got Iborde with Beautiful Life I Live. This is such a cool, raw album from Iborde. It's a kind of noise punk, bedroom rock album that sees Iborde kind of letting out all of his frustrations in super raw and visceral manner. There are some longer songs on here, some really beautiful moments too where he his vocals get a chance to shine especially i would say on flannel daniel um the highlight of this album for me not just because my name is daniel and i do like listening to it in a flannel he really does show a lot of vocal ability on this album even if some of it does feel a little bit angsty that's okay because that's kind of what i feel like this style of music is supposed to be i get a lot of influence from like Carsey Headvest, I would say, on this album. I don't know if that was an influence of his while making this, but totally that lo-fi sound on here sounds totally like something Carsey Headvest would have done back in the day, except maybe a little less noisy, a little less angry than this thing is. But yeah, I really love it. Great, great project for my board day. Beautiful Life I Live. Check it out on Bandcamp and SoundCloud. It's not on Spotify, though, unfortunately. And at number 14, we got the album Pitchfork gave a 10 to Vegetable Cutters, Fiona Apple. Obviously, with me placing this album not at number one means I didn't quite like it as much as Pitchfork did or some of the other publications giving it rave reviews did. But I still think that this is a really, really solid album from Fiona Apple. She has some really great standout tracks on here like Shamiko, which is a great storytelling song. Same with Newspaper, actually. Probably my favorite of hers lyrically on this album. And uh, Cosmonauts is a super, super beautiful song. I mean, this is probably the song I come back to most on the album just because it blows my mind every time I listen to it. That climax that happens multiple times throughout the song is absolutely incredible. This album feels super rough around the edges in a really good way. It has a lot of interesting sounds, great drum beats, and some really interesting stuff like Fiona using her dogs on the song, and I really love it. I do think that there are some moments that are maybe a little too rough around the edges where she didn't focus enough on providing good structure to her songs, but that's totally okay with me. It's still a really solid album from her, and I'm really interested to see where she goes with this sound next, or if she comes up with a totally new sound. Either way, Fiona Apple, Vegetable Cutters, really, really great album. 
And at number 13, we got what I'm going to be honest, I was not expecting, but my favorite country album this year from Chris Stapleton, and that is Starting Over. I'm guessing that if you're watching my channel, you're probably not the biggest country fan just in general, but I urge you to look past some of the cliches on this album, because I won't lie, there are a lot of country cliches on this album, but when you do look past that and you see the fantastic instrumentation, amazing vocals, and just great song structure on this album, it really just shows how Chris Stapleton is actually making some interesting statements in the field of country. I wouldn't really say that there's a moment on this album I don't love. It's really great from front to back. Again, even with those cliches, I think that instrumentally and vocally, this is just an incredible album that I was kind of addicted to at one point this year. I just couldn't stop listening to it because of how interested I was by what Chris Stapleton is doing within this genre. And I also want to mention uh, Watch You Burn, which is definitely the highlight of this album, an incredible, incredible song about the Las Vegas shooter. And man, it just gives me goosebumps every time I listen to it. Easily one of, if not maybe my second favorite song of this year. It's a beautiful and haunting song Chris Stapleton did an incredible job on. So at least check that song out. But otherwise, this starting over Chris Stapleton, great, great country album. And at number 12, we got my man, Dan Barrett, Blackwing, with No Moon. This album kind of sees Dan taking the sounds from his Blackwing is Doomed album and making it, well, better. While I did like Blackwing is Doomed, I did think that there were a lot of issues with it. I didn't really think that he had mastered that kind of digital electronic sound that he was going for in the same way that he mastered the acoustic sound of Giles Corey right from its self-titled. But on this album, I really feel like he did a fantastic job of doing that. There are some really, really beautiful and haunting songs on this, like Is This Real Life, Jesus Christ, or that vocal sample, extended sample thing at the end of uh, Choir of Assholes which is just absolutely beautiful. And in addition, there are some just show-stoppingly amazing moments on this album, like the transition between Always Hurt and Vulnerable, where you get this super duper somber song, and then it just suddenly hits you with this relentless wave of anger and hurt. It's absolutely incredible. It just completely threw me for a loop the first time I listened to it and every time I listened to it since then it's just given me such an amazing rush of adrenaline and Vulnerable is a song that I could actually talk more about and I kind of wish I could except I don't want this video to be incredibly long because I know I'm going to be talking more about the albums that are closer to number one on this list but Vulnerable is an absolutely incredible song showing almost an animalistic type of vulnerability instead of how vulnerability is perceived from us as humans. And yeah, Dan really just did a great job of creating a super beautiful album using those same ideas from Have a Nice Life and also Giles Corey, but making it more digital as was kind of the promise with this whole Blackwing project. It's really, really fantastic from front to back, has an amazing epic closer as Dan always does with his music. Really, I highly recommend this. Check it out. It's No Moon from Blackwing. And at number 11, we got Clipping, with visions of bodies being burned. Now, I think I'm in the minority here, saying that I actually prefer there existed an addiction to blood over visions of bodies being burned. I really do love this, and obviously, I think they work amazingly as companion albums. I just personally preferred some of the songs on There Existed an Addiction to Blood just being so incredibly, mind-blowingly good, especially Blood of the Fang with its lyrical proudness. It's incredible. But on its own, Visions of Bodies Being Burned is still a fantastic album. 
there are so many great highlights on it, like um, Check the Lock, which is a song that I always just get a bit of paranoia from, but I really do love, and Say the Name, which has that sample of the visions of bodies being burned going throughout it over and over again, and is really, really amazing as well. And Body for the Pile, really great highlight too. Clipping just do not miss, and this album is a further example of that. It's a really great spooky time album that I'm sure I'm going to be listening to every Halloween along with There Existed an Addiction to Blood. And yeah, Clipping, they outdid themselves again. Really, really great album. <sighs> Here we go. Going into the top 10, every single one of these albums I've considered for album of the year at one point. Every single one of them. So... This is going to be really close. Don't think that just because an album's at my number 10 spot that I didn't absolutely love it because I truly did. Any of these could have been album of the year and I honestly wouldn't have been that mad about it. And that being said, at number 10, we have The Avalanches with We Will Always Love You. Surprisingly, this didn't seem like an album that got all that much critical acclaim which was really disappointing to me because I absolutely loved this thing. It's definitely a different style than what Avalanches were doing on their previous two albums, especially since I left you. But I still think that it works really well with them kind of taking some influence from rap and also the Plunderphonics still and having some really interesting uh, interludes and spoken word bits that were really strange and haunting but really worked well when compared with the fantastic songs on this album. I mean, really, there are so many great highlights on this album. Avalanche has never failed to deliver something really tasty, whether it's from the title track or the absolutely incredible Take Care in Your Dreaming featuring Denzel Curry, or Running Red Lights, which features such a strange combination of features, but works super well. I mean, Rivers' performance is one of my favorites of his ever. As the avalanches are always able to do, I'm pretty much just completely buried within the sound of this whenever I'm listening to it. There are maybe a few moments that were a bit boring, but those honestly don't matter that much to me when compared with the entirety of this album. Avalanches just have an incredible ability to just take sound and just put you straight into it and just make you feel like there's nothing else that exists other than it. While I still wouldn't necessarily call this their best, just because you can't really beat since I left you, We Will Always Love You is a fantastic addition to Avalanche's discography and an amazing album from this year. And at number 9 on my list, we got Microphones with The Microphones in 2020. The Microphones in 2020 is the first album recorded under the microphone's name in quite a long time, really since Mount Erie. And it kind of sees Phil taking this look back through his entire songwriting career, through really his entire life. And I think that the music video is incredibly important for this as it shows these pictures from Phil's past and you just kind of see like how he's progressed and also the pictures he takes is really, really beautiful. I love just looking at them. But this album could easily be perceived as boring. I can totally see that. It starts with this seven minute long guitar piece that just repeats and repeats and repeats. And when Phil does start singing, it's mainly just the same guitar piece throughout the entire thing. Of course, there are some variations to it and some interesting sounds pulled in there, but you know, it's not really about that. It's not really about how much it just viscerally interests you because this is a very cerebral experience for me. I feel kind of like I'm also going into Phil's past with him, kind of trying to find this endless search for meaning. And that's kind of what Phil's entire discography has felt like for me, an endless search for meaning, trying to find some sort of resemblance of meaning within this crazy chaos of a life and I'm really glad that he made this just to kind of look back on that endless search and really just put it all out there into one song slash album it's 
really, really beautiful, and I highly commend Phil for doing that. I love, love, love this album. And at one point it was my album of the year. It did slip down quite a bit, obviously, but not through any fault of its own. It's a really, really great album. So that's my number nine, Microphones in 2020. And at number eight on my list, we have such a strange and unique concept album from Koreatown Odyssey, Lil Dominique's Nosebleed. As you can see from the album cover, it's all about two car accidents that Dominique got into when he was a little kid. And the album isn't strictly focused on that, but mainly just focused on his upbringing and also how those car crashes affected him. And it's really fascinating to me that he would choose to make an album about this, and I think it works incredibly well. Occasionally, he kind of steps out of his own character to do some social commentary on the things that he's seen, like Attention Challenge and Weed in LA, but he also has some really great moments with some actual vocal snippets from like his mom after he got into the car accident. I don't know if that actually was somehow lifted from the phone conversation or if they just recreated it. But either way, it's it's really great, and I really, really love what Dominique is doing on this album. And I'm really interested to see where he goes next, because he has incredible storytelling ability and some fantastic hooks, fantastic beats. It's just a really great and fascinating rap album overall. And so yeah, Lil Dominique's Nosebleed. And at number seven, we got... Midnight Medics, Deep Sea Aquarium. Oh man, I came back to this album recently and I realized I had it way too low on my list of best albums of 2020 because this is an incredible kind of dark ambient, electronic, minimalist album noise, maybe. I don't really know what label specifically I would put on it, but no matter what, it's a really, really beautiful album. On this album, Gavin really just has such an incredible sense of melody, of kind of creating this sense of low-key beauty, of not having to do something super extravagant to get it. He has fantastic hushed vocals that just pull you in and make you feel like you're right there when he's saying it. It's really, really amazing. And there are some incredible piano pieces on this thing too. Especially, I'd like to point out A Night Between the Mountains, which completely blew me away the first time I heard it, and every time since, I've absolutely loved it still. It has all these competing piano melodies kind of dancing, but also fighting and clashing with each other in this beautiful display of brokenness and conflicting emotions. I really, really love it. It's like you're trying to focus on this one specific emotion and not let anything else distract you, but it can be really, really hard to do that when there's always so much going on in your life. And yeah, I mean, this album just kind of feels like that entire display of somebody trying to make sense out of their life, trying to come to some kind of peace with it but this constant struggle within it. There are some incredible vocal moments on this album. Gavin really has an incredible way of manipulating his voice in such interesting and well-suited ways for the kind of message that he's trying to convey. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely loved, loved, loved this album. Midnight Medics, Deep Sea Aquarium, such a beautiful, and sad album. Check it out if you want to. And at number six, we got Blue in Exile with my rap album of the year, Miles. Blue in Exile are an incredible rapper-producer duo. They have truly mastered how to create this incredible balance between amazing and gorgeous beats and also fantastic rapping and storytelling. This album is over an hour and a half of non-stop rap goodness. It really is incredible. For anybody looking for conscious jazz rap, like it doesn't get any better than this. It really doesn't. I can't think of anything I would recommend before this, although maybe their previous album together, Below the Heavens, would be a great place to start too. 
But regardless, whenever Blue and Exile come together, they make something incredible. And this album is absolutely no exception. Easily my rap album of the year, Miles. And now going into my number five, we got the Tema with Necroscape. This is probably the weirdest album I've heard all year. Such a strange fusion of genres. I mean, if you thought Method's Body had a lot going on, this thing has so much packed into it. It is so strange and all over the place, but so beautiful. I mean, there are so many genres fused into this thing. I don't know if I could even name them all. But the band members really don't sacrifice quality for weirdness on this album. It's, it seems like they're really focused on creating super high quality songs. They might not make that much sense to me, but there is not a single moment on this album that doesn't captivate me every single time I listen to it. It's incredibly, incredibly strange and confusing, but it's also just a really, really great album that I come back to whenever I just want something interesting to spice up my life. And really, that's a pretty high compliment I can give to an album, even if it doesn't make sense to me at all. And at number four on my list, we got Fleet Foxes with Shore. This is another album that I've seen making a lot of people's number one for this year, which is really understandable. Fleet Foxes did it again. They made yet another incredibly beautiful, lush folk album that just pulls you into their world in a way that I really don't feel any other artist can in the same way. This album maybe does have a bit more of a beach vibe, but I've always associated Fleet Foxes with more of a mountain foresty kind of vibe, and I would still attribute that to this album. And while I wouldn't necessarily call this their best, I still think that award would go to Helplessness Blues. I think this is still a beautiful album regardless. There are so many fantastic highlights on this album, like Sunblind and Can I Believe You, The Way Up to Quiet Air, and Cradling Mother in the title track. It really just never stops being amazing. They really delivered something that fits super well into Fleet Fox's sound without sounding like they're doing the same thing all over again. Amazing, amazing album, sure. And at number three on my list, we got such a strange, but probably the best concept for any album I've heard this year, post-excavation activities. This album's concept follows an idea of an archaeologist kind of digging up these old tape loops and stuff from some old time period and trying to restore them, trying to find some kind of history from them. And man, it is incredible. The album itself doesn't feel like that much without the context, but once you know the context, you feel like you are that archaeologist kind of going into this music and trying to find some semblance of melodies and stuff out of all the fuzz and the noise that has surrounded this album from the sands of time. It's really incredible. I mean, I put it this high up on my list because I haven't heard anything even remotely like this before in my life. Of course, I have heard, you know, tape loops and stuff, William Basinski and all that, but nothing that's been used in this kind of concept and it just blows my freaking mind. It is incredible. I really don't have that much more to say, but man, check this out. It's on Bandcamp. It is an incredibly strange, but such a beautiful album that's post-excavation activities. And at number two on my list, we got, I hope I pronounced this right, Ichiko Aoba with Windswept Adon. Again, I could have pronounced that horribly wrong. I'm sorry. But regardless, this is one of the most beautiful albums I've heard in my entire life. This album completely encapsulates serenity. It transports me to 
kind of what the scene of this album cover is. Just this really beautiful underwater setting that, wow, I just absolutely love. Her voice on this album just completely pulls me in and is one of the most beautiful voices that I've ever heard, really, ever. It was really close to making my album of the year, honestly, and if I was more interested in what this album had to say conceptually, it definitely would have been. Just because this album completely defines beauty in a way I feel like no other album could this year. So yeah, wow, such an incredible album. I really couldn't put into words how beautiful this thing is, so if you want to check it out, you gotta just listen. Just go straight into it uninterrupted, let the serenity wash over you. It's absolutely incredible. And finally, this brings me to my album of the year. And that's where things are a little hard because my album of the year is three albums. All by the same band, kinda. And all are absolutely incredible. So let me start with my first one. Totally Completely by Harbour. <laughs> oh man, this is the only one that I've reviewed yet on this channel. So if you want more of my in-depth thoughts on this album, go check that out. But regardless, this thing is incredible. It was my album of the year really before last week. It's such an amazing rock album that really gives me hope for what rock can be, that rock isn't dead. There's such a huge variety of incredible moments on this album, from how hard Acid Rain hits, to how beautiful tracks like Tranquilizer or Garden are, to some really interesting kind of ambient stuff on this album as well. And the best closer to any album this year, one of my favorite closers ever, round of applause with its incredible almost metal sound and one of the best climaxes I've ever heard. And there's some fantastic writing on this album as well with songs like Broken Hands being really incredible and putting you into these really dangerous and fascinating situations that I absolutely loved. I was absolutely blown away by this album. Incredible, incredible work of art totally completely by Harbour. But then, later this year, after Totally Completely was released, one of the band members, Matthew, decided that he was going to release his own album. Also, an incredible album, my second album of the year, <laughs> Look at My Van Gogh. This is an incredibly beautiful and heartbreaking album, kind of talking about the unfortunate passing of his father from cancer. And even just the story behind the album's cover is incredibly beautiful with that painting being of his father from, I think, one of his father's friends. It's so incredibly beautiful. And Matthew does such an amazing job of showing that loss and that hurt and that pain from track one all the way through to the end. It's even better written than I would say Totally Completely was, especially since it's so personal and songs like Adapt Without My Love, and also Dear You, which is such an incredible, kind of eerie and unnerving song, but really, really fantastic song. I just, I have so many amazing praises I could put onto this album. Matthew Ryan outdid himself with this. It's incredible and beautiful. But that takes me to my third and what I would say is really my number one album of the year. The album that surpassed easily any other album I've listened to this year. It's The Light Has Gone Out of My Life by Harbour. Their second release of 2020. And this is a masterpiece. This is a masterpiece of an album. I'm going to do a full review on this album in the coming weeks, so... You'll get my full thoughts on this, but man, let me just tell you right now, this, this is exactly what I needed in 2020. The exact thing I needed in 2020. 
it is such a beautifully heartbreaking album about everything that Ben had taken away from him this year, all the struggles he's been through, especially with isolation and any other struggles he's had too, which are highlighted so beautifully on every single song on this album. The writing on this album somehow makes the writing on Totally Completely look absolutely amateur. There are so many incredible songs on this. I really cannot emphasize that enough from front to back. This is just completely watertight. Again, I'm not going to go into all my thoughts on this album or the specific tracks just because I want to do a full review on this soon, but this is easily my album of the year. Easily. If there's any album I'd say you should listen to, it's definitely this one and really just harbors entire work and definitely support them. Support every other one of the artists I've mentioned here, especially the smaller ones. They all really, truly deserve it. These were incredible albums and it was really hard for me to pick between all of them. But yeah, what are your guys' thoughts on this list? I know everybody's had a lot of different ideas on what their album of the year is, so I'd love to hear what your album of the year is because I probably missed a lot of amazing albums from this year that could have made this list easily. So yeah, let me know. Let me know if there are any albums you'd like me to review next. I'm probably going to be doing a few more albums from 2020, as well as doing a few classic albums. But then I'm going to be launching into some of the new albums from 2021. And I'm incredibly, incredibly excited to do that. So let me know in the comments down below. But besides that, yeah, have a great rest of your day, everyone.